We all love a great story. And whether your podcast is story-based or not, I think the elements of storytelling can help you create a better podcast. On this episode of Podcastification, we're talking with the storyteller for kids, Jonathan Messenger. My name is Carrie Green, and I am the Client Happiness Guy at PodcastFastTrack.com, and this is Podcastification. Podcastification is all about you, teaching you how to podcast, how to put into practice the best practices that I and my team have learned in working with hundreds of clients. You are going to podcast better from listening to this show. If you like what you hear on Podcastification, please just hit the pause button, swipe to the sharing function on your app, and share this episode with somebody you know will benefit. And if you'd like to get in on more podcastification goodness, you can do it by subscribing to our podcast optimizer email series. And I promise you, you won't get lots of junk. You'll just get one actionable email a week. Go to podcastfasttrack.com slash optimizer. That is enough of that kind of stuff. Let's get you podcastificated right away. Jonathan Messenger is a dad, just like me, though his kids are a little bit younger than mine. And he got into telling stories for kids for the sake of his kids. And you'll hear about that in our conversation. But Jonathan and I crossed paths because he became a member of my team, doing some audio editing and writing for me on the side. And he has been just an outstanding team member. And when I began thinking about this issue of storytelling, and what it means to craft a good story. I thought of Jonathan right away because his podcast, The Alien Adventures of Finn Caspian, which you're going to hear more about here in just a bit, is very creative, quite original, and tells a really good story in a way that engages his audience. So whether you're looking for tips on learning how to tell stories better and how to integrate that into a normal kind of an adult podcast that maybe isn't even story-based, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Or perhaps you're interested in learning some audience engagement tips. Man, Jonathan is really doing a great job getting kids involved. And think about how difficult that is. Most kids, the age that he's sending his stories out to, don't have their own smart device, most likely. They have to go through a parent in order to do it. And yet he's getting tons of interaction. I think you're going to learn a lot from hearing this conversation I had with Jonathan Messenger. Jonathan Messenger, welcome to Podcastification. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Kerry. Oh, you're so welcome. Man, it is good to have you here. I'm excited to talk about The Alien Adventures of Finn Caspian. That's the name of Jonathan's show. And Jonathan, why don't you just tell us a little bit about, first of all, why you got the idea to start a show about, I don't know, a story for kids. Yeah, well, there's sort of two sides of this origin story a little bit where one is that I have a fiction writing background. I ran a small publisher here in Chicago for a number of years publishing fiction. So I've always been a, a fiction writer and I had an idea for a children's book that was the basic premise for what The Alien Adventures of Finn Caspian is. And around that time where I started to put together that idea, my son, who's now eight, almost nine, I think he was five and he really had just discovered audiobooks. We started listening to audiobooks in the car all the time, both on road trips and then just driving to school. So I started looking around for a podcast for him because I was a big podcast listener to see if there was something that he might like. But there really wasn't at that time much out there and nothing that I could find. I now know that there were good shows for kids, but at the time I couldn't find them. There were a lot of kind of recycled public domain, fairy tale kind of podcasts that he liked. But as a parent, I, <laughs> I didn't really enjoy listening to them yeah. too much yeah. in the car. And so I thought, well, maybe I could do a podcast. Instead of writing this as a book, I could chop up the chapters into episodes. And that would open up this whole side of things to make the podcast much more interactive and could really take advantage of a lot of the things that podcasts can do that you know a book can't do. So that's really kind of how it all kind of came together. Well, that's very interesting. I've written some fiction before as well, and I've been toying with the idea of instead of creating an audio book, creating chapters as podcast episodes. And so you're inspiring me here. 
that right. the idea might be a good one. How practical is that? Do the chapters naturally fall that way? Or since you're doing this for a podcast initially, do you do some changes to make it a better fit for the media? It's definitely changed a lot. I think when I first wrote, when I started the show, I had written the first five or six episodes of the first season. And as it went on, I started to realize that I had to make some changes, that there were things that the way I was writing them to be read on the page did not necessarily serve an audio medium. And plus, I started having a lot of fun making ridiculous sound effects (laughs) and robot voices (laughs) and alien voices and that sort of thing. And so I just started scripting a lot differently once I got in the flow of things because I realized there was, of course, so much more you could do when you have all of this technology at hand. Yeah. Now, this is purely selfish question for me to ask you because I'm thinking about my potential project. But what are the kind of things that you think that the person reading needs to be aware of when they're reading an actual fiction book for an audio medium? Uh, Are there certain types of uh, phrasing and language that need to be modified? What would you what would you advise me there? One thing is that just reading it aloud will show you the errors of your ways, basically. (laughs) Because once you start reading things aloud, you can feel yourself slowing down in parts that might be getting a little boring or using words or turns of phrases that might look pretty on the page, but hearing someone say them sounds unnatural. I guess two things that I do. One is that I should say, and actually I should not have gotten this far without saying this, that my son Griffin, who's eight years old, is the editor of my show. And so he's really the boss. And he, what (laughs) I do is I read the story. When I write the story, I read it to him before I record it. And he gives me feedback on what he liked and what he didn't like. And I also do what I call the Lego test with him, where when I'm reading the story, if he suddenly stops listening and walks over and starts picking up his Legos, then I know I've done something wrong. I've, (laughs) I've lost him. I've bored him. And so that's been really helpful. And then the other thing that I find really helpful is that even though when you're recording a podcast, whether it's you or whether you're by yourself or with somebody else, a lot of times you're in this kind of closed space and it can feel very strange to be very expressive, you know, because you you tend to be a little bit of quiet sitting at a mic by yourself. So what I always try to do is act as though I am reading this to an audience as I'm doing it. And that not everybody is necessarily comfortable doing that. And obviously with kids, that's a different thing because I may get a little hammier than somebody reading for an adult audience would want to. But I found that I think what happened for me was that I realized that when I was unhappy with my readings, how I was recording it, and then I would go and I would read a book to my kids. And when I was reading my a book to my kids, I was very expressive and really trying to engage them as I was reading it. And I was like, oh, I should probably be acting the same way on my podcast uh, because the audience is not even seeing anything or seeing me. So they really need to hear that, I think. That's great advice. I remember when my story idea first came about, it was stories that I told to my kids in the car while we were driving around. You know, I just made them up off the top of my head. And my kids started nagging me to write these into books. And, you know, initially we thought about kids' books, but though the plot line that I've written is loosely based on those same characters, it's much more serious and and much more dark. So it's more for a young adult, whatever audience. But regardless of all that, I can see how the drama and the inflection that you give to your voice is much more apparent in a live setting than if you're just just reading a book. Yeah, I could imagine a children's story time at the library or something like that. If you if you could picture yourself there reading to the kids, that would probably lend itself much more to a podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we might talk about this more, so I might be jumping the gun a little bit. But I think that when you're doing a fiction podcast, music is such a huge part of it uh, for a number of reasons, like all the things that you already know, like setting the mood, perking up the listener's ear, because if you listen to just voice for, especially a kid, but I think any audience, if you just listen to one voice for a a long period of time without any other change, you can zone out pretty easily. So music really helps with that. But I read this book that I think, I really, I believe this for anybody, any podcaster, whether you do an interview show, 
a narrative nonfiction show or a fiction podcast. There's a book called Out on a Wire. Yeah, I just heard of that this morning. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a phenomenal book. Jessica Abel is a writer. She's a graphic novelist. She's a, she is one of my favorite graphic novelists, actually. That's how I found this book. And she interviews a lot of the great narrative podcasters or radio hosts like Ira Glass from This American Life, uh, Glenn Washington from Snap Judgment, Judd from Radio Lab. That book was really, really helpful for me to think through storytelling as an audio medium. And one of the things that Ira Glass says in that book that I think was really helpful was what he calls signposting, which is when you're telling a story, there are various beats in that story, various things that you want the audience to remember or to signal to them, this is important to keep in your head as you continue on in the story. And so music is really big for that, for signposting. So if you have a kind of a moment that you really want to in a book, it might be like a paragraph break or a uh, chapter break or something like that, or a section break. And audio music can really do that for you. So it can really, you can have some sort of whatever sound cue it is that you want to help the listener tune back in, make sure that they are hearing this and it's getting kind of implanted in their brain as they continue on. And that was a, uh, a really helpful thing for me. It's, I think it's one of those things that as a listener, you kind of innately know that is happening without ever actually knowing it. <laughs> or, yeah, or you're, not, you're not really paying attention, but it's sure affecting you. Yeah, right. And so it was, it was really interesting to see the thought process behind that. And that book is, I highly, highly recommend it. Well, that is a great recommendation. And I appreciate you indulging me here with my uh, curiosity about my project that's potentially coming up. Yeah. But let's get back to Finn Caspian. Uh, why a robot sort of a theme and, and future space kind of stuff? Why did you choose that sort of a, a storyline? The original idea for the show, for the book and then for the show, was that I wanted to do something that kind of brought along with it the classic children's books that I loved as a kid. And so the original idea for the book was that there are these robots and every kid gets a robot at some point in their life. And the story it ends up being when you turn eight, you get your own robot. And the way your robot gets their personality is by downloading classic work of children's literature onto them. And then they become kind of some form of that character from that book. And so in the show, Finn Caspian, the hero of the show, when he turns eight, he puts Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne into his robot. And then the robot takes on some of the personality traits of Phileas Fogg, the hero of that book. Hmm. And for me, I've always been a big reader, always loved kids' books. And the one thing that I really wanted kids to take away from the show was that reading is just sort of the book that you love is just sort of the beginning. And then everything that you do after that, all the things that it makes you imagine, ideas that it gives you, uh, whatever it inspires you to think about or to do is really like the important thing that books are kind of living, breathing things. And so that was really the kind of driving principle behind the story. That robot idea is really uh, where it came from. And I think when my son was five years old, I'm sure space and robots were pretty huge in my house. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably so, especially yeah. with the resurgence of all the Star Wars movies and all yeah, that kind absolutely. of stuff. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So your son is the editor. Let's talk about that for a second. When you say editor, you mean like an editor of a novel. He's, he's listening to the story. He's giving you feedback. He's instructing you on what works and what doesn't work. Is that what you mean? Right, exactly. So he's not my podcast editor. He's not going into the DA and editing, chopping up the story or anything like that. But yeah, he is yeah. giving me feedback on how the story is working, where the story should go, that sort of thing. And he actually comes on to every episode at the end of the story. We have a music break and then he comes on and we talk about what he liked and what he didn't like about the show and various ideas he has for the show. And we have a lot of kid interaction on the show. We play jokes that kids tell. They send them into the show. We play them at the end of the episode. 
kids. We always have kind of like puzzles and riddles on the show and kids solve those. We've just had a whole lot of really fun stuff that kids have done with the show. And so Griffin, my son, he kind of serves as the voice of the kids in the audience. And so he's always kind of starting clubs on the show. Like he started a sound club where kids send in sound effects for the show that they make and that sort of thing. That is really cool. I love how you're getting the audience engaged in your son being a kid, you know, a member of the age demographic you're aiming at really can give you the right kind of feedback uh, for what you now. Now, give me an example. What's the kind of feedback he, he gives to you? I mean, other than the Lego test, what sort of things does he say to you when something's not working? For example, if um, we've had stories where maybe I've let the kids off the hook a little bit, <laughs> you know, if they're like, uh-huh. so the basic premise of the story is that the kids, these kids live on a space station. They travel from planet to planet and uh, help aliens that live on those planets. And sometimes they get into trouble on those planets. And I think sometimes I've maybe let the kids off the hook a little bit. And so he's an advocate for more danger <laughs> for really? the kids, putting the kids in, in greater peril. A lot of times the feedback he gives me happens when I'm stuck and I'll say to him, hey, I have this idea for this planet. This is what's happened in the story so far. I don't know how to get them out of this situation or I don't know what should happen next. And he's very good at coming up with ideas for what that next story could be. Uh, that is really cool. I love the way you're working together on this. I have a question that's kind of unrelated to the podcasting bit of it and the creative side of it, but what has that kind of a cooperative relationship done for your relationship as dad and son? I think it's been really great. It's been really wonderful to work with him. And it's been, you know, one of the things that I really want to show kids who listen to the show and then it kind of lives in my house as well is really valuing the input and imagination and the skills that kids bring to things. And so Mm. I really do consider it a partnership. You know, there are times like in anything with the kids where he doesn't want to record (laughs) and and, and our episode comes out the next day and we have to record. And so there's always (laughs) uh, that issue that comes up every once in a while, but it's been, uh, it's been really great. It's been, I hope that he sees that I'm really valuing what he, what he brings to the show and that that helps his own confidence in what he wants to do. Yeah, I can see that. That's really great. Well, we've kind of teased people long enough. Uh, let's stop for a second and just give everybody a taste of one of the episodes of The Adventures of Finn Caspi. And let's roll it right here. Hello and welcome to The Alien Adventures of Finn Caspi. My name is Jonathan Messenger, and from what I understand, a lot of you don't know who Finn Caspian is. But of course you've heard of the famous Marlow 280 Interplanetary Exploratory Space Station, right? I'm just kidding. Of course you've heard of the famous Marlow 280 Interplanetary Exploratory Space Station. You and everyone in your family and everyone you've ever met has heard of the famous Marlow 280 Interplanetary Exploratory Space Station. But despite all the Marlow books and movies and songs and board games and interpretive ballets and casual dinnerware and trading cards and monogram school supplies and fruit snacks and patio furniture and the Marlowe Planet Pilates 20 minute workout DVD volume ones through five. A lot of people haven't heard the story of Finn Caspian, one of the Marlowe's greatest heroes. So I'm here to tell you Finn's story and how he and his best friends, Abigail, Elias, and Vale came to be in Explorers Troop 301, taking off from the Marlowe space station to explore uncharted planets, help all sorts of crazy and occasionally two headed aliens and solve a mystery that threatened to destroy the Marlowe. So every week I'll tell you another story of Finn Um, and how Excuse me. Sorry about that. So every week I'll tell you another story of how Finn and his Ahem. How Finn and his friends are Ahem. Finn and his friends Excuse were going me. to I'll tell you the story Pardon that me. I'm gonna tell you Excuse that Excuse me. Finn and his friends Pardon will me. Excuse me for a second. Yes? What is it? Aren't you going to mention the robots? Yeah, but that was going to be a surprise. Oh, sorry. Spoiler alert. Okay, sorry about that, but yes, it's true, as my mechanical friend here implied. The Marlowe is full of robots, and the story of Finn getting his very own robot is how the Alien Adventures got their start. So every week, we'll bring you a new story, each episode only about 15 to 20 minutes, perfect for when you're running errands in the car, waiting for dinner to cook, or winding down before bed. Now here's one last thing. Because this story is for kids, I need kids to help me tell it. My six-year-old son, Griffin, will serve as my editor. Say hi to everyone, Griff. Hi, 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 hello. Great. 
Thanks. And I need his help and yours to make sure you're getting Finn's full story. So if you go to fincaspian.com slash contact after each episode, you can tell me what you think of the show, what else you would like to see, what you think will happen next, what your favorite book is, or what you had for lunch. Any idea you have may help shape this story. And we'll play some of those ideas in each episode. So have your parents subscribe to the show in iTunes, Google Play, or whatever app they use to listen to the podcast. You can also hear each episode at fincaspian.com and in a couple of weeks on the Finn Caspian app for iOS or Android. So subscribe because starting August 9th, we'll begin the alien adventures of Finn Caspian. And, and yes, there will be robots. Spoiler alert. All right, Jonathan. So that was really cool. Tell me what goes on into creating a clip of that type. I mean, tell me a little bit about your process. Yeah. So that was actually the first trailer I ever made for the show. And that was, as you heard, there's a robot voice in in there. And uh, when I was coming up with the idea for the show, I really wanted to have it not just be an adult talking to kids. So I created this robot character to co-host the show with me. And he kind of pokes at me the whole time I'm trying to be this serious artist on the radio (laughs) or on the podcast. He's poking at me and, and undermining me, as you heard in that that clip. (laughs) And so hopefully that makes it fun and makes it very approachable for kids. And so I spent a lot of time, as you can hear in that clip, there's the robot voice. And I was trying to find a robot voice that was intelligible for the audience so that you could understand what he was saying that didn't just sound like a human doing a robot voice kind of a thing. Sure. Sure. And that disguised my voice enough where a kid could hear it and not be sure who the voice and really maybe even believe. And a lot of kids do, which is great. So if any kids are listening to this episode, the robot's real, (laughs) but, but but it is masking my voice. And so uh, I spent a lot of time. I use a um, plugin, a post-production plugin by sound toys called little alter boy, A L T E R boy. And I use that for so many of the voices on my show, for alien voices, robot voices, everything. It's a really great plugin. It's pretty affordable and uh, and it's done wonders for my show. And actually, I should say too, that that really, that robot character, until I had to make a trailer for the show, didn't really exist. And I just, I wanted something to liven things up. And that I just started, a lot of times with that character, I just kind of improvised by myself to try to get something funny to happen. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of how that clip came together. Well, that is really neat. I like the whole concept and uh, having that little tool, which by the way, will be in the show notes for this episode or in the description of your podcast app, you can find the link. Uh, that is just really cool to have a tool like that, that you can find that's so versatile and enables you to do so many things. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, amazing. thanks for sharing that. We're going to go to our mid roll break here. And when we come back, I want to kind of turn a corner and talk to you about stories themselves and why stories for children and hear a little bit of your passion there. So uh, listeners, don't go away. We'll be right back. The very fact that you're listening to podcastification tells me you probably already have a podcast of your own launched. And just like Jonathan, You are learning how to do it step by step. You kind of learn by doing and you make mistakes along the way and you get things refined as you go, including what your podcast is about and the kind of format that you want to represent your brand and the way that your show is presented to your audience. If that is you, way to go. I'm glad you took the bull by the horns, you weren't afraid and you jumped right in. But I know that there's likely some people listening to this episode who are kind of investigating whether you want to start a podcast or not. And that is the person I want to speak to right now. I want you to know about a course that I've created here at the Podcast Fast Track Workshop called How to Podcast Step by Step. And guess what it's about? It's about how to podcast step by step. I take you from the very beginning to the very end, the launch of a podcast that has been well thought out, that has been created up to professional production standards and is something anyone can do step-by-step on your own. The course has 
12 video modules. Each of them is 20 minutes or less. And along with the video modules has step-by-step downloadable PDF instructions so that you can go through the steps you just learned on the previous video, step-by-step, doing it yourself, getting the work done so that by the time you're done with all 12 videos, you have your podcast actually launched and submitted to iTunes and many other directories. If that sounds like what you've been looking for or sounds like something someone you know may be looking for, I encourage you to check it out. It's only, get this, 99 bucks. Think this through. For 99 bucks, you can have a podcast from zero to launch, ready to go. I mean, quite honestly, this course could sell for 500 bucks and it would sell for 500 bucks. But I'm not here to make money on teaching you how to podcast because you can find that information out on the internet for free. But I've compiled it all together. I've included best practices based on our experience with hundreds of clients over the last five years. And I want you to have it for this low price. And so I'm asking a price just so you have some skin in the game. You've got something invested and it's going to matter to you more because you do. You can go to podcastfasttrack.com slash HTP for how to podcast and you'll find the how to podcast step-by-step course pass it along to someone you know who could use it or use it yourself to create that podcast you've been dreaming about okay we're speaking with jonathan messenger about his show the adventures the alien adventures of finn caspian and jonathan you've just been giving me all kind of cool insight into your production process but i want to talk a little bit now about just stories in general what have you learned about stories and storytelling i use the star wars series all the time as an example of how we human beings just love stories and we love identifying with characters and we love hating the, the evil people and all of that kind of stuff. What is it about stories you think that makes them such an appealing thing and why stories for kids? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, there's probably seven <laughs> questions in there, but you can give it your best shot. Yeah, sure. Well, so I think that sort of going back to what I was saying before about why stories are so important, I think that they really are the beginning, right? I mean, they allow us to kind of enter another world and then bring that world back with us uh, and allow us to kind of indulge our imaginations in a way that maybe we don't when we're at our day jobs or or whatever we're doing, commuting or that sort of thing. I think that there's a real value there to just allowing uh, yourself to be kind of carried away a little bit. And I know that certainly I would say that there's a way of connecting through story that I can't quite articulate, <laughs> but, but when you hear a great story told, say, first person, or you're reading a, a book and you know somebody else is reading that book at the same time, just the way that kind of connects you to to that person is, is I think, really uh, an amazing thing. And I know that like my wife and I, when we we will often listen to a podcast separately and then at night talk about that episode. It's always a really fun and and fascinating conversation to see what each other got from it and and what we pulled out of it. Yeah, that is really cool. I've got an 18-year-old son and a 15-year-old daughter at this point, and that's their ages. And I hear them often talking about a book series that one of them has read and the other is currently reading. One of the ones that comes to my mind is the Septimus Heap books oh, yeah. that are out. And they will uh, be talking about these characters as if they're real people and saying, oh, that part where he did this and that, you know. And, and I'm always fascinated by the connection that it makes between them as siblings. Yeah. Uh, they have this common interest in this common storyline that they both are following and can talk intelligently about. I think that there's something about stories that enables us to learn and grow in a way that we don't in normal life. Uh, Something you said about engaging the imagination that is behind that. Why did you decide that you wanted to create this, particularly for kids? I mean, you could have written a fiction book or even done a fiction podcast for adults. Why for children? As a parent... So many times, and this is not the case across the board. There's obviously wonderful books 
movies, cartoons, shows for kids. But I think that as a parent, what I notice is that there's a, a sort of trend in uh, a lot of children's media, which is that like kids have to be explicitly learning at all times. Right. <laughs> so it's like if you're being. Told yeah. So story, Dora the Explorer. Yeah. Right. 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 Like Dora the Explorer, like you're being taught this as you're being as you're enjoying this thing. And there's always this kind of funny thing that happens in shows like that. I guess I haven't seen too much of Dora the Explorer, but in other shows that I've seen with my son, where there's like this weird kind of check-in that happens all the time where the adult seems to be like, you're having fun, right? You are having fun. You're enjoying this. This is fun as you're learning. (laughs) (laughs) And I just, I don't know, something about it was making me really frustrated. So I always like to joke that the Alien Adventures of Finn Caspian your kid will learn nothing as they read it, <laughs> as they listen oh, to it. Oh, that's great. Uh, but I, so I just, I wanted to, to do something that was really fun for kids that could, they could really lose themselves in. And then I really wanted the show to be interactive. I really do believe that kids' voices are really important and really amazing and kids have the best ideas. So we have all sorts of things on our show that try to forefront kids voices. So we have things like kids will write in with ideas for planets where the characters should go to. And I'll, I'll use those ideas in the show and credit the kids for them. Kids, like I said, will tell jokes. Bebop, my robot co-host, he was named by the kids. They did a, I did a poll and the kids named oh, the, that is cool. the robot. And the whole kind of trick of Bebop is that he's a robot whose entire diet consists of eating art. And so I made a plea to my (laughs) audience that my robot was eating all the art off my wall. So please send in drawings so I can feed the robot so he stops eating my art. And so kids send tons of drawings in and we put them up on our website and our social media and that sort of thing. Like I said, Griffin has started this thing called Sound Club where kids make sounds, their parents email them to us, and then we manipulate them on the computer to become the sound effects, the rocket ships, the laser sounds, monsters, that sort of thing in the show. So it's been really, I I just really do believe, I remember, uh, all right, I'll say this this is going to be a quick tangent here, but do you know the author Mo Willems? No, I'm not familiar with. He's a children's author. I think it probably his most famous book is Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. Um, okay, I think I've seen a, the book. Yeah, that's it's a hilarious book. He has another book called Knuffle Bunny that's a very popular children's book. Uh, he's great. He's amazing. And I remember I used to work for a weekly magazine here in Chicago, and he was coming to town, and I interviewed him. And I remember him saying, I'm going to paraphrase here. It was an amazing interview, but what he said was, imagine you're a kid. The whole world is not built for you. You walk into a room, all the furniture is too big. The light switches are too high. Nothing is like is made for you. You can't open the refrigerator yourself or whatever it is, you know, for little kids anyways. Uh, can't reach the cookies in the cookie jar. <laughs> right, right. And so your whole life, the whole world is telling you that you're not ready for it yet. This world is not built for you. And that interview with him was probably 10 years ago, but that idea has really stuck with me all along. And so that has always been kind of, in a lot of ways, my guiding light is to make stuff that makes kids feel like they're in control and they're the ones who are really driving the ship or piloting the ship. I guess you pilot a ship. <laughs> yeah. You you pilot the ship. That is, that is a cool perspective. Now notice something in there in the description that you gave. You are taking audience engagement to a whole new level. With your show and with the way that your audience is interacting with you. Take me back to the beginning when you first started trying to solicit audience participation. Uh, What are some of the things you tried that worked and some of the things you tried that didn't work? The reason why I created the robot that ate art was because I knew that if it wasn't a game to kids, if I was just saying to them, draw something and send it in, that It would be something that their parents would tell them to do or encourage them to do and not something that they would want to do on their own. And so if I Mm. made it a game 
where it's like feed the robot before he eats all of Jonathan's art, <laughs> then yeah. they would participate. And so that's always been the kind of thing that I've tried to do is I know gamification is kind of a marketing buzzword, but that's really something that I've tried to to do as much as possible uh, with all of the, the different kind of interaction things that we've done. I think the one thing that hasn't, it's it's worked, but not as well as other things have worked is that we had this character who was kind of an, the villain of this one storyline. And that villain actually took over the podcast where I wasn't hosting it anymore and Bebop wasn't there and it was just the villain. And the villain was saying like, if you can solve this riddle, I'll give the podcast back to Jonathan and, and Bebop. And kids have responded well to that. But I think that it's, I think the kids they want to help more, you know, they want to be a part of what's happening and not necessarily stop what's happening. That's um, interesting. Yeah. And so I, I think that that antagonism has not resonated as much as we're all on the same side. Let's all do this together. I think that has worked a lot better than, than having this kind of villain character challenging the kids. Yeah. I can see that. That that's very interesting to, that you even noticed that subtle little nuance to what you were asking for. Yeah, that seemed to make the difference. Yeah, but that's a audience engagement is a huge thing for me. I think that for kids' podcasts, it's it's really important and really fun. But I think there's a lot of things you could do if you're podcasting for adults to really kind of up your audience engagement. And that that sort of gamification is, I think, the one thing that I would encourage people to, to think about. That is a neat idea. Now, let me ask you, what are you using in terms of technology or platforms to have this back and forth communication? Is it just email? Do you have a Facebook group? I mean, how are you doing that kind of stuff? Uh, email is is the biggest. I have a Facebook page, but not a group. Instagram is pretty popular because I can share a lot. It's a good platform for sharing the artwork that the kids send in. I use Google Forms a lot. So if kids want to solve riddles and that sort of thing, they the parents fill out the Google Forms. That's been really uh really helpful and doing, you know, sometimes I'll do polls and that sort of thing and uh so I always use Google Forms for that. And then I encourage parents to record their kids using the voice memo app on their phones and email those to me. So that's how I get a lot of the kids voices, but I also have a uh Google Voice number that people can call and leave, you know, jokes or whatever they want on that voicemail. And, uh, it's a pretty interesting inbox on that, (laughs) that voicemail, because (laughs) there are definitely some kids who, uh, discover the, the phone number on their own and call it. It's pretty funny. That is pretty funny. I'd love to hear some of those. There was one time where I used to have it where the Google voice would, would, uh, ring on my cell phone and there was one time where I was woken up at midnight and I looked and I was like, what? I didn't recognize the number. It was some number in kind of Northwest Canada. <laughs> and the next morning, I found like three three minute voicemails of a, of a kid just making kind of spooky sounds <laughs> that he wanted me to use on the show. It was, it was a little eerie. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. If you had picked that up in the middle of the night, that could have yeah, been kind right, of odd. Right. Yeah, it reminds me of some friends. They, their kid had this little uh, big bird thing that talked and laughed and stuff like that, uh, but it was all motion sensitive. And so one night, the mom's walking through the dark living room on the way to the bathroom, and she hears "heh heh 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 heh," and uh, and uh, big bird was in the trash the next morning. So uh, <laughs> one of those one of those funny kind of things. But I could see that with that voicemail, that would be funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Jonathan, this has been great. I I would love to hear uh, just your advice for podcasters, whether they're podcasting to children or to adults who want to, well, let me just say two things. Number one, make their show more engaging just in the way they produce it. Let's just start there. You mentioned music. You've used a lot of sound effects in your show. Just for the average adult-oriented show, whether it's an interview-based show or something else, what do you think are things that work? They just plain work for engaging an audience in terms of keeping their attention and making the show stand out to them. I think having defined segments in a show is a big thing and having kind of recurring features can be very helpful as well. So 
for me, it might be, we have this time at the end of every show where we play jokes sent in by listeners. And that's been really great. But I think a lot of shows could have a couple minutes at the end of a show where they do some sort of audience celebration thing. You know, a lot of shows do like reading reviews off of iTunes, which I'm not a huge fan of that. I never like to really listen to that. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. But I think that there are things you, you could really think through. How can I get my audience voice onto my show somehow? And how could I have it be a recurring feature? So, And I think that, again, having those, you know, if you have a nonfiction podcast, having some sort of segment recurring could be really helpful. Yeah. And if any of you want to hear a podcast that does this very well, you should check out The Retirement Answer Man. He's one of my clients, Roger Whitney. Um, and you can find his show at rogerwhitney.com. But he has four or five segments on his show that happen week after week after week. Sometimes he'll leave one of the segments out. Sometimes he'll add an additional one. But he's got specific music that introduces each one. He's got specific voiceover that announces each one. And he just does that week after week after week. And I agree with you, Jonathan. It's, it's much more engaging. Yeah. So tell me some advice you would give to your average podcaster on audience participation. So in other words, getting feedback from your audience, getting people to send you voice clips or suggestions for your show. How can a, a podcaster of just your normal adult podcast be more effective at that kind of thing? Well, I think that you just, you can't demand it. You can't just ask. It's not the field of dreams, right? <laughs> like you can't just make it and people <laughs> will come. You yeah. have to think through, if you were a listener, what would make you participate, right? And it wouldn't be just, oh, I love the show and I want to do this. It could be rewards of some sort, I suppose. But I think if it was something that was really fun, you know, maybe it's having people, maybe you have them, if you have a show about a certain topic, you have people record a couple of minutes of a story that relates to that topic. And, you know, if you get enough of those and there's one or two that are great, then you can play them on the show. And that I think that goes a huge a long way. And so I think that you have to really think about like, if you were a listener to a show, what would get you to kind of get off your butt and do something? And the other thing that I'll say too, this, I got some really amazing advice early on on this. And I always like to credit her with this because I think it's really important. Her name is Jennifer Brandell and she runs a company called Harkin and Harkin helps uh, newspapers, uh, news organizations, I should say, engage with their audience more and have the audience participate in the news gathering process a lot more. And she's an old friend of mine. So I reached out to her when I started the show and I was talking to her about audience engagement because I knew it was something I really wanted to do. And what she said to me was, you really want to have different levels and different ways of engagement depending upon because different people in your audience are going to be comfortable with different levels of engagement. So you may have Hmm. one level of engagement that's record yourself, send it in and we'll put it on the show. And there's going to be very outgoing people who want to do that. There are going to be people people who are super fans of your show who will never do that, but they may do something else like send an email or they may retweet a tweet or whatever it is. And so you should never just have the one way of doing something because you're going to be excluding a huge part of your audience who doesn't like to do that one thing. So if you have these different levels, it may create a little more work for you because you have to track these different things, but it will get you more engagement because it's meeting your audience at their level of comfort. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, that goes back to something you said before, you know, people are often asking for you know, go onto iTunes and rate and review my show. I am never going to go onto iTunes and rate and review a podcast because <laughs> right, right. I, I'm an Android guy, first of all. Yeah. I have to open up a program on my computer to go and rate your show. I'm not going to do that. So I suggest that people do some other kind of call to action that's a little less platform specific in that case. And here I just hijacked the topic, but that's just an example. No, I think that's totally that right. You're though. saying. So Jonathan, this has been great. I wanted to be sure and highlight though, that you're not just producing the Alien Adventures of Finn Caspian, which is a really cool show. You're also very involved in a a children's podcasting group of sorts. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I am part of Gen Z Media and we make a lot of different podcasts for kids now. And basically what happened was that there are these guys in New Jersey, 
really great guys who made a show called uh, The Unexplainable Disappearance of Mars Patel, which is a fantastic audio drama. It won the Peabody Award a couple of years ago. And it's a full scripted with kids' voices. It's it's really great. And that show came out, started, I think, maybe a month or two after Finn Caspian did. And so I just started talking with them because we were doing similar things and became good friends with them. And then we they started a company together to make more shows. And then uh, they make stuff for kind of middle, middle of school age kids. And so we joined forces about a year and a half ago. And now I'm running an imprint of Gen Z media called Gen Z Kids that makes shows for elementary age kids. And it's been a blast. They are really hard workers, really great people to work with, great collaborators. And we have, I think, 10 shows now. The other show that I work on is called Pants on Fire, which is a a game show for kids (laughs) where uh, every week is a different topic. We have bring in two experts. One's a real expert. One's faking it. And the kid has to figure out which is which. And it's really fun. Oh, that is a great idea. But we've also made, I can't take credit for this work, but they make a lot of other audio dramas for kids. There's one called Six Minutes that comes out twice a week. Six minute episodes is kind of like a kid version of Jason Bourne movies. And uh, it's just yeah, been, a, wow. it's been a lot of fun. So our website where you can find all the shows that we make is called bestrobotever.com. And that has all of our shows. You can listen to them all on there or find the subscribe links on that website. Wow. Bestrobotever.com. That is really a cool name. It's kind of intriguing. It's like best robot ever. What does that have to do with kids stories? But then it's it's almost obvious right away yeah, when you know, ask th- yourself the question. We came up with, I think, a hundred different names. None of us could ever agree with it. And then my partner, Ben, called me one day and he was like, I bought the name. It's bestrobotever.com. And I was like, oh yeah, that's great. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Executive decision. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, well, that's funny. I met Ben and Chris at uh, DC Podfest a couple of years ago. Oh, uh, yeah. Great guys. Yeah, great guys. Uh, that, that, was, uh, really that was actually where stuff. I met them too. I didn't I didn't meet you there, but that's where yeah, I, yeah. I think that's before we crossed paths. Yeah, yeah, right. I was there. Yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, it was a fun event, that's for sure. Yeah, that's great. Jonathan, thanks so much for your time today and for sharing uh, the Alien Adventures of Finn Caspian and all of your experiences with us. I know this is going to be a great benefit to my audience, whether they podcast for adults or for children. Well, thanks so much, Carrie. This was a lot of fun. I agree. Hello? Wow. That's all I can say is, wow, Jonathan has really come upon some really great strategies for not only creating great stories that have interesting sound effects and and approaches to the way he's engaging with his audience, but the way he's getting interaction from his audience and the ways he's going about soliciting that interaction are really incredible. I would love to hear what you think about the things Jonathan is doing and the ways that he's interacting. The best way that you can do that is to join our private Facebook group for listeners of this show. You can find it at podcastfasttrack.com slash Facebook group. And that's all the time we have for this episode. You know what time it is. It's time for you to go out and make it a podcastificating day. This show is brought to you by Podcast Fast Track, where my team provides professional podcasting services without the time suck. Full production, editing, and show notes, all in one monthly subscription package. You can find out more at podcastfasttrack.com. Now go out and make it a podcastificating day. Audio editing and show notes by podcastfasttrack.com. Get 15% off your first month by mentioning this show.